on those living in the pitch black darkness of a long forgotten place where spirits were dimmed and hopes were dashed and the future grew bleak and the world grew weary of itself a light finally shined at first distant and faint it rose quietly over the people like the dawning of the sun until deep shadows gave way to sunbursts of light and weeping gave way to outbursts of joy and divine absence gave way to glad presence at the sound of a baby's first cry the christmas story is about a promise fulfilled an age old prophecy come to pass unto the ancients before us and now unto us and unto everyone who comes after us into every pitch dark place that ever has been and ever will be a light shines eternally in the form of a child given a wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father prince of peace who calls us to walk in the light and love of god join us this advent as we wait for the light and welcome the child who meets us where we are and takes us by the way that leads to the kingdom of god Good morning, St. Andrew family, and welcome to our Sunday morning online worship service. I'm Justin Bullis, and it is my privilege to welcome you here today from the St. Andrew Sanctuary. I'm grateful, as always, to share this sacred online space with you, where we are all invited, included, and valued as vital and beloved members of our broader worshiping community. St. Andrew is proud to be an open, affirming, inclusive congregation that welcomes all people into the full life and communion of our church. This includes saints and sinners, believers and skeptics, the lost and the found, the wanderers and the wanderers, families of all shapes and sizes, and people from every point along life's journey. No matter who you are or where you've been, no matter what you believe or even if you believe anything at all, you are welcome here and you belong here. Please take a moment to visit gostandrew.com slash sign in to let us know that you're here and to share some information about yourself. We'd love to know from where or from when you're joining us today or if you have any prayer requests or questions about our church. If you would like to explore deeper engagement with the work that God is doing in and through the St. Andrew community, you can email us directly at connect at gostandrew.com. We'd love to hear from you. Also, be sure to check out the announcement slides at the end of this video to see some upcoming events and opportunities to get more involved. You can also visit the events page on our website to see an updated events calendar. Lastly, if you would like to give a financial gift to the work and ministry of St. Andrew, you can visit gostandrew.com slash give or text St. Andrew to 28950. And now let's listen together as Reverend Mark brings us the second sermon in our Advent series, Unto Us, Mighty God. Give the King thy justice, O God, and thy righteousness to the royal Son. May he judge thy people with righteousness and thy poor with justice. Let the mountains bear prosperity for the people and in the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the needy and crush the oppressor. May he live while the sun endures and as long as the moon throughout all generations. May he be like rain that falls on the mown grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days may righteousness flourish and peace abound till the moon be no more. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May his glory fill the whole earth. Amen and Amen.
May 6th, 2023. The location, Westminster Abbey, Buckingham Palace. The occasion, the coronation of King Charles III. Did you get your invitation yet? The coronation of King Charles III will continue a tradition of crowning kings and queens that goes all the way back nearly a thousand years and will be the first in seven decades when Queen Elizabeth II took the throne in 1953. Because I don't read People magazine or watch Entertainment Tonight or The Crown, I confess that I understand very little about British royalty. All I really know is the British monarchy traces its history back to William the Conqueror, who, while invading England in the year 1066, marched in like he owned the place and then said, yeah, I think I'll own the place. And there have been about 40 monarchs since. King Charles III will be the 41st at a time in British history when most young adults no longer think their country should even keep the monarchy. Why? Mostly because of the growing perception that the monarchy is out of touch with the real world struggles of ordinary citizens. The coronation of King Charles III will cost about $54 million US. Charles will be decked out in about four billion dollars worth of coronation regalia. That's billion with a B. That's some serious bling that includes the St. Edward's crown, the sovereign's ring, imperial state crown, sovereign's scepter with dove, sovereign's scepter with the cross, sovereign's orb, gold ampulla, the spurs, and the sword of offering. All, of course, adorned with diamonds and sapphires, rubies and pearls. And from a purely fashion perspective, all those body baubles are no doubt pretty swag. But at a time when one in five Brits are living below the poverty line, the optics of wearing four billion dollars worth of shiny stuff are not really great. You won't find many Brits saying, Wow, the the king really gets me. I mean, I feel like Charles really sees me under that five pound crown. Contrast that image with one from today's scripture, Psalm 72. The psalm written for the purpose of being read or sung by the priest at the coronation ceremony of a new king of Israel or Judah. Coronation ceremonies were big deals back then, like they are today. They took place at the door of the temple before thousands of people. And they were sacred ceremonies. Kings represented the ruling presence of God among the people. They were enthroned to carry out the will of God on earth, making decisions and taking actions on God's behalf. Psalm 72 is one of nine royal psalms, as they're called. You'll find them in the whole book of Psalms. And these psalms praise the king as God's chosen representative on earth. But more than words of praise, I think these royal psalms also served to remind the king of his most important tasks. That is, what must always be absolutely top of the agenda, front of mind, non-negotiable for every king. So imagine for a moment, kneeling before the priest and feeling the weight of his hand on your head and hearing the gravity of these fateful words spoken over you at your coronation. The priest says, give the king your justice, O God and your righteousness. And may he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. May the mountains yield peace for the people and the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor 
and give deliverance to the needy. Justice, righteousness, defending the poor, delivering the needy. Did you hear what the priest just prayed over you? It's like he's saying, this, your royal highness, is your job description, your whole political platform. And I know you have to build roads and dams and sewer systems. I know we need strong defense systems and space programs, transportation, infrastructure. Maybe, O King, you're thinking about corporate tax breaks or banking regulations or government rebates for electric vehicles and solar panels. But at the top of at the top of your list must be these two things, justice and righteousness for all people with special attention to the poor and the needy. Justice, as we've seen before here at St. Andrew recently, justice is mishpat in the Hebrew. It's so important, this concept of mishpat, that it appears over 200 times in the Bible. Mishpat means something like to treat people equitably. This has legal implications, of course, that imply that everyone is treated fairly under the law. It ensures that the law is not applied unfairly or circumstantially or with partiality. In other words, Mishpat is this eye for an eye kind of justice, regardless of who you are. But Mishpat also has deep social implications. It ensures that there's no bias or prejudice based on one's social position in society. Whether you're rich, poor, middle class, a president, a plumber, a a paper boy, a a widow, a waiter, a, a winemaker, there are no distinctions of worth or value or importance. All have dignity. All are represented in the ultimate concerns of the common good. And Mishpat says no one, by virtue of their power or privilege, has an unfair advantage. Which may sound like bad news if you happen to know powerful people in high places who can do you favors. But it also says no one, no one because of their lack of power or privilege, has an unfair disadvantage. And that sounds like good news. If you're poor or sick, if you're an immigrant, a foreigner, or an orphan, Mishpat guarantees you'll always be treated like everyone else because you matter as much as everyone else. It acknowledges that not everyone who's standing on third base actually hit a triple. And it acknowledges that there are some people sitting on the bench who've never even been given a chance to step on the field. Mishpat seeks to resolve one of the oldest problems in the book, our human proclivity to otherize people, to overlook or disregard them, to see them as less than worthy, maybe even less than human. And so with his prayer, The priest reminds the king, judge and decide according to mishpat. Don't judge by what your eyes see, because sometimes you see only what you want or expect to see. And don't decide by what your ears hear, because sometimes you hear only what others tell you, or what you've already been told, or what you've already told yourself, or maybe even what you expect to hear, none of which is always the truth. Isn't that our human nature? Do you remember the story about a man in a baseball cap standing in an arcade outside a metro station in Washington, D.C. in 2007? He sat there playing his violin. He played Bach, Schubert, Ponce, Mendelssohn. Over the course of 45 minutes, 1,097 people passed by him as he played. Only seven stopped to listen for any length of time. 27 of them left the tip, most without even stopping. In all, he collected $52.17 
$20 of which came from just one passerby who recognized him. Recognized him as the same violinist who just three days earlier performed at Boston's Symphony Hall to a sold out audience with an average ticket price of $100. His name? Joshua Bell, one of the most accomplished musicians on the planet. Dressed in disguise in a metro station, appearing as some ordinary street performer, Bell played some of the most intricate musical pieces ever written on a 300-year-old Stradivari violin that was worth over $3.5 million. And virtually no one noticed. With Mishpat, we look upon the other, we hear the other, with the eyes and the ears of the heart. We see worth and beauty where no one expects to see it. And so the priest says, give the king your Mishpat, O God. And then he prays, may he judge your people with righteousness. The Hebrew word for righteousness is zedek. It's a derivative of zedekah. It appears over 150 times in the Hebrew Bible. That means it's another major concept central to our faith. Zedek is almost impossible to translate because of its many shadings of meaning, justice, charity, righteousness, fairness, innocence. But I think it's maybe best understood in a single passage from Deuteronomy. It says in Deuteronomy, if a person is poor, you shall not sleep in the garment given you as the pledge. You shall give the pledge back by sunset so that your neighbor may sleep in the cloak and bless you. And it will be to your credit before the Lord your God. Uh, this passage describes a weird situation for most of us moderns, but in ancient times, if you owed a debt, a garment, your garment, was given over to the lender as collateral or security until you could settle up on your loan. You could hand over anything, really, something else as collateral, but of course, if you're poor, you probably had nothing else but the shirt off your back to give. And your lender actually had the legal right to take the shirt off your back. But of course, acting on this legal right is simply not the right thing to do. It ignores the human situation that you, as a poor person, have nothing else with which to keep warm on a cold night. Acting with zedek means doing the right thing, returning your shirt to you for the night. Zedek means something like justice tempered by the right and decent thing to do. In ancient times, Zedek looked something like leaving the edges of your field and harvested and, and letting the poor come in and glean from it, letting them take what they need because it's the right thing to do. It meant back then forgiving debts and releasing indentured servants about every seven years so that no one would have to live a lifetime of indebtedness and slavery because it's the right thing to do. In our time, it means being moved enough to act on whatever human need we see. After the we are the world phenomenon in the 1980s, Bono of U2 traveled to Ethiopia with his wife, Ali. And they were there for a month and something extraordinary happened to him one day. He'd wake up in the morning and the, the mist would be lifting and he'd see thousands of people who'd been walking all night to the food station where Bono and his wife were working. One man had this beautiful boy and he was speaking to Bono in Amharic, and Bono couldn't understand what the man was saying, so a nurse translated for him. And she said, the man is asking you to take his son. He's saying, please take his son. He would be a great son for you. 
you must take my son because if you don't take my son, he will surely die. And Bono, by the rules, had to say no. And he said he walked away from that man, but he said, I've never really walked away from it. Because at that moment, he said, I became the worst scourge on God's green earth. A rock star with a cause. And ever since, Bono has met with presidents and prime ministers, even popes, advocating for the poor. It's not about charity, says Bono. It's about justice. Zedek. It's actually not charity or justice. It's actually both. That's the true meaning of righteousness, justice and charity that repairs the world by doing the right and decent thing. And so at the coronation ceremony, the priest prays over the new king. May he judge your people with righteousness. Justice and righteousness, Mishpat and Zedek, according to the ancient coronation prayer, these are what make for a true king. Not crowns, not scepters, swords, or gold ampulas. A true king treats people equitably and does the right and decent thing. Mishpat and Zedek. Some of the ancient kings of Israel and Judah ruled with Mishpat and Zedek, and some did not. And you can read the prophets, and you'll see that bad things happened to Israel and Judah when kings failed to rule with Mishpat and Zedek. Their nations were conquered. Their citizens were exiled and enslaved. Their temple was destroyed. Their, their people wept. And even the mountains mourned. And their thrones were reduced to a tree stump. But one prophet named Isaiah, spoke of a coming king who would be different. Like a branch shooting out from that stump, a child would grow up to become a mighty king. Only mighty didn't mean strong and powerful and heavy-handed. This king, said Isaiah, would be El Gabor. In the Hebrew, it's translated mighty king, but it really means powerful champion. God-like hero. This king, in other words, would be a defender of the poor, a defender of the needy, the people's hero. And he'd champion the cause of equity, and he'd, he'd do the right and decent thing, even if it meant he'd have to wear a crown of thorns instead of gemstones. The Mishpat and Zedek. And from this set of history, we believe the king that Isaiah prophesied about came in the person named Jesus. Jesus was El Gabor, powerful champion, godlike hero, by whose life and by whose rule on earth made each of us kings and queens in our own time and place. We don't have to be monarchs sitting on a throne to be God's royals. Every child of God, not just kings and queens, every child of God is chosen and crowned to live noble lives of mishpat and zedek, justice and righteousness. What does the musical artist Lord sing? We'll never be royals, royals. It don't run in our blood. It's a pretty cool song. Pretty catchy groove, but it's not true. We are all royals. It does run in our blood because in Christ, we are made sons and daughters of God. Which begs the question, who are you a champion for? Are you living a God-like heroic life? Lori and I have a close friend in San Diego who's battling cancer. As we visited her and her family over Thanksgiving, she asked me to bless her seven-month-old granddaughter in lieu of baptism, which will happen later when the family is able to attend. And so I adapted a, a baptism prayer that we use here at St. Andrew while my friend 
fished through a drawer and found some anointing oil from the Holy Land. And then we all circled around the baby and I anointed her head with oil. And I prayed these words. Let your love for her be a seal upon your heart, a mantle upon her shoulders, and a, a crown upon her head. A mantle and a crown. These are words you'd assume are intended not for a baby, but for a king or queen. But that prayer is a reminder, you don't have to be a monarch to be God's royal. You, like Jesus, the mighty God, are royal. You are chosen and crowned to live lives of justice and righteousness, mishpat and zedek. And so, hear this prayer over you. May God's love for you be a seal upon your heart, a mantle upon your shoulders, and a crown upon your head. Our takeaways for today, in Christ, the mighty God, you are royal. Like Christ, see and hear with the eyes and ears of the heart. And with Christ, repair the world by doing the right and decent thing.
As you return to the rhythms and routines of the busy holiday season this week, I leave you with this Advent benediction from Tim Graves and posted on his blog, Liturgy Bits. We call out to you, be the God we dream. You respond by being the God you are. We discuss you and define you and expect of you, but you unravel our expectations and definitions. We seek to limit and control putting you in a box of our making, you turn our boxes upside down. We seek now, you bid us wait. We seek obvious salvation, you send a child. We seek clear cut and easy answers, you give us hope. Upside down divinity, give us the strength to resist a culture of greed, of haves and have nots. Turn our eyes away from the gold statues, our idols of selfishness and fear. Help us to let go of our expectations of you so that we might be ready to welcome the child who is on the way. <laughs>